This video examines some of the benefits and compromises involved in the transition from the kind of intratextual annotation I covered in the last video to the extratextual annotation I'll be demonstrating here. However detailed and graphically intuitive the annotations we write in digital texts like PDFs might be, they still rely on the document being open to the page on which the content is inscribed. This kind of intratextual annotation sacrifices the ability to organize citations from a variety of sources under coherent categories, which limits our ability to compare multiple citations across works, as a more comprehensive historical survey might require. Here's the citation tree I made while studying for my comprehensive exams, trying to balance the close intratextual reading I had been doing with the need for broader extratextual comparison. Currently, it's collapsed to the first level of the hierarchy. The titles of the literary and theoretical reading lists I was responsible for. Clicking on either of the plus buttons will expand the lists individually. To expand them all together in OneNote, I use the Shift-Alt-2 command, 2 designating the second level. This shows the various authors on each of the lists. Shift-Alt-3 reveals each of their works. Some 20th century American novels, theories of modernity and postmodernity, structuralism and deconstruction, historical materialism, technology, and memory. Shift Alt 4 opens the work specific themes I created to sort the various quotations from each. I was able to sort all of the citations from Faulkner's Absalom Absalom into a dozen or so thematic categories having to do with narrative, domestic space, race, memory, and various forms of sexuality. For the theoretical work of Paul de Man, these themes were more invested in the various tropes and genres he interrogates, along with his reflections on methodology, pedagogy, and politics. Some of these themes are more or less equivalent to the individual essays within each work, but I generally try to juxtapose different formulations of similar ideas that appear throughout several essays. Here is a recent collection of essays on Paul de Man grouped by the contributors. As nice as it would be to cross-list J. Hillis Miller's thoughts about theotropism under the corresponding theme from Allegories of Reading, or vice versa, manually maintaining and syncing multiple instances of citations across themes proves more difficult than it's worth. I had to limit each instance of a quotation to one thematic heading so that I would be able to differentiate citations from primary and secondary sources. Returning to Absalom Absalom, we can see the fifth level of the tree, on which the quotations are grouped under each theme, and the sixth, where I add any additional notes that were not implicit in the theme itself. Since the structure of the tree requires the subordination of citations and annotations alike. I was surprised by the thematic flexibility and clarity gained by making these difficult choices. A large number of thematic subdivisions applied to a larger sampling of citations allowed for a more concrete negotiation of the conceptual territories involved in each. The citation tree not only forced me to prioritize themes that would easily translate into exam essays, it also required me to justify the inclusion of passages I felt were important despite their lack of exam relevance. After I had read and annotated the various PDFs on my list, I began constructing this tree by copy and pasting citations under their corresponding works, sometimes coming up with themes along the way, and sometimes only after I'd finished copying the citations. Selecting passages that span multiple pages, like this opening passage from Absalom Absalom, actually isn't that easy using a mouse. I usually begin the selection with a mouse, drag it to the end of the page, and then hold shift and hit page down until I reach the desired end page, then backtrack with the directional arrows, still holding shift, until I reach the desired endpoint. With the passage copied, I can paste it into an entirely new theme for the novel, or a pre-existing one. This theme about Sutbin's house as a work of art works well enough for now. I'll create a new line indented to the sixth level, and paste the passage. This reveals a few errors in need of correction. Any characters or words misread by the OCR I used are now apparent, and the relationship between line and paragraph breaks must be restored. This doesn't always happen, but it can be a real pain when it does, especially for longer passages. Rather than using the mouse to reconnect broken lines, try using the same keystroke. Here I'm holding down control and hitting the down arrow to reach each new line, the left arrow to reach the end of the previous line, the delete key to join them, and space for space. I'll keep doing this until I reach the actual end of the paragraph, 
and then start again from the next. You can see why it's always nice to have a facsimile PDF available to cross-reference while correcting digital type. Once I've finished formatting the paragraphs, I add the page range and finish correcting the other OCR errors, fixing phrases in italics that were difficult to read, adding italics where they were not recognized, adding dashes that were mistakenly read as paragraph hyphenation. Unfortunately, maintaining the various paragraph breaks within longer citations makes it more difficult to tell where each citation ends and to quickly select and organize entire citations by dragging them. If I were editing this tree in Word instead of OneNote, I might compromise by using the manual line break instead of the paragraph break, which I can see when I display the formatting characters and type Shift Enter, but this is hardly an ideal solution. The meaning of intratextual PDF annotations is more easily inferred from the immediate visual context of the page that contains them, which is scrollable and thus more or less continuous. Copying these citations into the citation tree, however, means severing and defacing their contextual relevance. In order to preserve some of this context in the citation tree, I generally had to include the whole paragraph or passage of which the annotated phrase was a part and then recreate emphasis using bold, underlines, and highlights. This did not work anywhere near as well as the highlights in Acrobat, which could be annotated and displayed more precisely. Comparing intratextual and extratextual forms of annotation, we must conclude that neither successfully balances the complexity of themes and the nuance of citations. Let's take a moment to recap the differences in terms of our experience as users, the structure of each method, and the way it formats the text itself. PDFs grant us the familiarity of the printed page and the kinds of annotations we're used to writing in books, which maintains the democratic emphasis of annotations across pages, even though we can only look at a few pages at once. OCR introduces errors that are difficult to fix in the PDF itself, but we always have the facsimile image to fall back on. The citation tree, on the other hand, allows us to move beyond the page and construct our own thematic categories, allowing us to easily manipulate the hierarchical relationship between text and citations within one document, but at the expense of the more democratic representation of the page, where notes don't need to be subordinated. While it's easier to correct errors in such a document, it's also harder to keep track of the original pagination. As we can see, there are benefits and drawbacks to both approaches. The tensions between these modes of annotation are some of the core infrastructural problems of digital scholarship. They raise the question of how we might merge the printed page and the thematic hierarchy, so that we might assign multiple categories to works and citations alike, and link facsimile texts with more editable versions, so that this kind of work becomes more efficient and sustainable in the future.